What a lot of people on both sides of this argument do is they cherry pick parts of verses that suit their cause and their viewpoints, which I'm going to argue on both sides are very worldly viewpoints that do not represent the true and everlasting kingdom of God that is the opposite of the ways of this world. And in those debates, we've divided Christ's church into tens of thousands of pieces, and we are just hemorrhaging his precious blood all over the place. Today, I want to talk about a subject that is vastly important to thriving with God for both men and women. And it's also one of the most divisive subjects in the body of Christ. So feel free to crucify me in the comments because like Jesus said, they'd know us by our vicious criticism and attacks of one another on the internet. But I'm not going to get into deep theological debates with you today about either side because both have already been done exhaustively. And I'm going to ask you to step into your heart and I know a lot of Christians balk at that and we're afraid to listen to the voice of our hearts, but I'm not talking about your fleshy human heart, which is the one that is so caught up in the vicious debates on social media. I'm talking about the new heart of flesh that Christ gave you when you surrendered yours to his. And frankly, brothers and sisters, most of us really fully haven't done that yet. And in those debates, we've divided Christ's church into tens of thousands of pieces, and we are just hemorrhaging his precious blood all over the place. In my experience, no one persecutes Christians like other Christians, and that is the exact opposite of how Christ called us to live, submitted to one another in love. So let's begin our treacherous journey here on the internet. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, perhaps one of the most contended passages, because I want to start with the fact that the Apostle Paul calls us to all submit to one another. In verse 21, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. He didn't say only women submit to men. He didn't say only men submit to women. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord, key words. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church, and the church submits to Christ. So you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. What a lot of people on both sides of this argument do is they cherry pick parts of verses that suit their cause and their viewpoints, which I'm going to argue on both sides are very worldly viewpoints that do not represent the true and everlasting kingdom of God that is the opposite of the ways of this world. The kingdom of God defies and flips on his head every tradition of men, every human tradition that began since our fall in the garden. So before we get deeper into that passage, we actually need to go back to Genesis 3.16. Just after the fall, when both the woman and the man ate the apple, when God says to Eve, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And prior to that, God created man and yes, woman came forth from man, but he created them co-equal to rule and reign over all of creation together in harmony. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying men and women are exactly the same. That's a cultural issue. God created us differently. And so in some ways, I agree with complementarians that we complement one another. What I don't agree with is where they take that to the next level and they take the word helpmate used to describe the helper that God created for Adam to mean a subservient, muzzled, silent maidservant, essentially, who cooks and cleans and takes care of the children. Not that there's anything wrong with traditional gender roles even. The problem is... When a man is behaving in a fallen way, so if you're watching this as a man, are you a Genesis 3.16 man who lords it over your wife and lords it over women and lords your power and authority over them? Because that is the way a fallen man behaves. And if you're watching this as a woman, 
Are you a subservient woman who has been muzzled, has no voice of her own, and doesn't have any confidence in her own voice or opinion or the gifts that God gave her? Because both of those things are fallen versions. That is a fallen, wounded biblical relationship. Or we flip to the counterpart egalitarianism that only picks out the parts of the verses that it wants. If we do a word study of that word, azer, E-Z-E-R, the Hebrew word for helpmate used to describe Eve, and we trace it throughout the entire Bible, we find that that word is used 16 times to describe God's life-affirming, essential help to humanity, as well as help during wars and crises. So just let that sink in for a minute because I think it's one of the most important things to keep in context when we read the scriptures of the New Testament. And the problem with most arguments is they take the scriptures out of context and we warp and twist them to mean what we want them to mean with our wounded, fallen human viewpoints. Because there are also women on the egalitarian side and people on the egalitarian side who want to lord it over men now. And as we go back to Ephesians that I started with, we are called to submit to one another as we submit to Christ. In order to read these scriptures in context, we have to take into account the entire Bible as a whole, not just the parts that support our points. As Brother Frank Viola put it, if we torture the Bible long enough, it will confess anything. And the Lord from the beginning taught me to read the Bible in a whole Bible perspective, to trace themes throughout the entire Bible, to get a good picture of his character so that I wouldn't just pull verses out to make them mean what I wanted them to mean, which I think every single one of us at some point in our walk is guilty of. And so how does Christ love the church? That is the real question and the perspective I think we need to examine in Ephesians 5. Christ doesn't love the church by subjugating her to himself, by oppressing her, silencing her, muzzling her, controlling her free will, and dictating her life, ruling over her, as the rulers and authorities of our day do. And yet, we aren't just doing that to women in the church, we are doing that to the entire church as a whole. I also agree with Brother Frank Viola, that the religious system, the institutional church, has become a representation of the world and not of Christ's kingdom. Don't get me wrong, a lot of good happens there, and there are many people whose hearts are totally for Christ, and he uses them in each and every congregation. But brothers and sisters, we need to remember that the church is not a building. It's the priesthood of all believers. As Peter wrote in 1 Peter 2.9, all believers... And so silencing completely the other half of the church is not what the Lord ever meant. And it's not what Paul meant, that a woman should never have any authority in the church at all. Because if we make that argument, we're effectively saying that even though women can be prophets, a prophecy that comes out of a woman can't be heard by a man, even though she's given authority from God to share it. And even though Paul said women can pray and prophecy in the church if their heads are covered, Essentially, we're usurping Christ's authority in women, not the women themselves, because women aren't the ones who have the authority. Neither are men in the church. It's Christ who has the full authority and headship over the church. And the way he rules over his church is servant leadership. And a lot of us don't even know what that means, because we are so entrenched in the dominance hierarchies and systems of this world We have turned the church itself into one, even though that was never his original intention. And I think the best argument for that is Matthew 20, 25, where James and John are arguing over who will have the greater authority in Christ's church, vying for position in the kingdom of God. And Christ first admonishes them saying, you have no idea what you're even asking, and explains to them that that position comes with great suffering. And then he calls them together and says, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many." I'm going to diverge now and share my testimony with you because the reason I felt called to speak on this today is because of my own personal direct experience, relationship, and essentially betrothal to our Lord Jesus Christ, who I am in deep communion and fellowship with. 
I'll begin by saying that I was a very angry woman prior to Christ calling me and healing my heart. At some point, my righteous anger broke loose, but it did take over, and I was a very angry feminist. But brothers and sisters, whatever you think about feminists, I think we need to take a look in the mirror as religious people and see where it came from. Because whatever you think of the matter, and absolutely they've taken it too far, the Bible doesn't call us to live like the world. It calls us to love one another. And women being so disempowered and so at the mercy of men and a culture that treated them as second-class citizens for so long, who couldn't protect themselves or their children from very real abuses by men, I'm not saying all men, even as a feminist, I didn't think all men were like that, needed more rights. We needed more rights. And yes, it's gotten out of control, but men had a hand in that as well. And so blaming women for feminism is incredibly immature. The truth is that most men perpetuating hardcore complementarian arguments and even women have not fully submitted to Christ as their head themselves, effectively making them spiritual infants and toddlers, which is what we see on social media when the true colors come out and people show how they really feel about all of this. And I would argue both sides, complementarian, traditional side, and egalitarian arguments are coming from a place of deep woundedness that we have been carrying around since the fall from grace, where women are meant to shoulder the burden for the entire fall, even though if Adam was such a great leader, submitted to God, he would have never eaten the apple with her at the very least. And even though every single male disciple abandoned Christ on the cross in his hour of trial and need, which is why he admonished them in the garden for falling asleep because he knew that every last one would, and the women stayed, and Mary Magdalene was first to see the risen Christ, she was later branded as a whore by a pope, even though there was no evidence for that. The Roman Catholic Church finally has dubbed her the Apostle of the Apostles. Brothers and sisters, I'm not saying that women should now usurp men's power and authority. I'm not saying that any one man or woman or small group of people should usurp the power and authority in the institutional church and religious system itself. We were never meant to lord it over one another, whether male or female. As Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are called to submit ourselves in love to one another. And so when Christ called me, he called me through a film about Mary Magdalene. And I saw his goodness and I saw who he truly was though. And he turned my heart and I said out loud, I'm going to be a disciple of Jesus for the rest of my life before I even knew what that meant yet. Which to me means submitting ourselves to Christ first and foremost. As our good and perfect shepherd, the only one who was ever meant to be the true shepherd of his church. And he began to transform and heal my heart. And you know what he never did? He never told me that because he was a man and because he was God, I had to listen to and do everything he said. I had no authority and I should just sit there and shut up. Because that is the dominant attitude in the religious system towards women. And I'm telling you, it's not of God. The way that Christ handles me is nothing like that. And any man who has truly submitted himself to Christ will know that a woman submitting to him comes from him proving himself and proving that he's worthy of the office. And it's never about silencing a woman. Let's go to 2 Timothy because that is one of the most contentious passages on this. If we take a whole Bible perspective, the bride of Christ, the church herself, is his absolute passion, his prized possession, his beloved, his queen. He put on flesh and descended from his throne in heaven to die a brutal and heinous death for her, not to subjugate, silence, and tell her that he was above her because he came first. Our Lord doesn't just treat me as an equal. He said to me once, I'm going to lift you up higher than the mountaintops and make you a queen. And he meant me, not just individually, but as a part of his church, his beloved bride. That is the God that I submit to because his love for me makes that effortless. 
His love for me leads me into just absolutely effortless, natural obedience, where I'm full of joy and happiness to follow him wherever he leads me. The opposite of that is a religious spirit that wants to subjugate women. And that same spirit on the back of the church has pushed countless women out of the church into the arms of the devil. And I don't blame women for wanting nothing to do with it all. But my heart breaks for so many of us who lose our connection and our relationship to Christ because we mistake her for the broken vessel of the church where the Bible has been deliberately weaponized against women because of fallen masculine views of women and subjugation of women. Don't get me wrong, women can be abusive too, but cutting a woman's tongue out of her mouth, stabbing her in the heart and telling her she shouldn't have feelings about it is the same behavior as a psychopath. And women cannot thrive in the body of Christ if they are completely muzzled. Women should learn quietly and submissively. I do not let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly. For God made Adam first and afterward he made Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived by Satan. The woman was deceived and sin was the result. But if you actually take it in context and look at what he said when he said, I do not, the word that he used for not means not now. It doesn't mean never and it doesn't mean ever. And he was speaking to disruptive women in the church who are trying to lord it over men, who are trying to usurp power and authority over men. And that, brothers and sisters, is wrong. But so is making a couple of people the head of a church and subjugating and silencing and muzzling the entire body as passive spectators sitting back who never really grow in Christ and remain spiritual infants hurling insults and criticisms at one another on the internet, making us all look like hypocrites to the rest of the world, to whom we are supposed to always be known by our love for one another. The Lord invited me into a sacred union. Essentially, he like proposed to me in the spirit. And I instantly said yes, because like I said, he is so good and so wonderful. I trust him to lead me. I trust him to guide me. I know that he loves me unconditionally. And that is the kind of headship that a woman can follow and submit to. But no woman is called to submit to a spiritual infant. Just as no man is called to submit to a woman who is treating him in the same way. And in order to take these passages of scripture and use them to silence all women in the church for all time, we'd have to ignore the part where Paul addressed women praying and prophesying in church. What is a prophecy? This video is a prophetic teaching, friends. God does not equip women with spiritual gifts for them to sit there silently. He equips us with gifts to build and lift one another up. And yet we've given that power over to a handful of people in the religious system, essentially silencing Christ throughout his church, not just in women, but in men also, and effectively cutting off our growth and maturity in him. As author Frank Viola puts it so well in his body of work, I will link a whole bunch of resources below for you that you can explore on these topics. But I'm going to continue to affirm that I am neither complementarian nor egalitarian. I am a disciple of Christ Jesus. And both of those perspectives diverge into extremes that are not of his kingdom, but of the world. I'm just here to say that there is a middle ground between the two extremes. And that it's also ridiculous for men to think that they can't possibly learn anything from women. <laughs> that when we look at the scripture as a whole and see the way that Christ loves us, loves his church, and loves women. I'm releasing this word because I feel that our Lord has called me to lift my sisters up. Whether you agree or not, I leave you to have your own opinions and make your own choices for your life. But I also appeal to you to come out of your frontal lobes and into your hearts, the ones that Christ has given you, the fleshy ones, to examine the parts that are still made of stone and take them to the altar of his cross and offer them up asking the Lord to guide you personally and transform your heart on this issue if you may be wrong. None of us are getting it all perfect. None of us are 100% correct and right. When we get caught up in these divisive doctrinal squabbles and debates, we lose sight of the greatest commandment of all, to love the Lord God with all our heart, mind, will, emotions, with our entire beings, and to love our neighbors and one another as ourselves.
And so if you're still watching this, I'm just praying that you experience more of God's peace than ever before, that you step into your power in Christ through the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. Allow him to do and complete his work in you. Ask him to search your heart and show you all of the ways that you are still in bondage to the world and its systems, ones that might be surprising to you. And I pray that if you have one on your back, that he delivers you from the religious demon that's oppressing you so that you can truly be free in him to live in his peace that surpasses all understanding and joy that knows no bounds in spite of the world around it. Because that's where I'm sitting now, friends. So much love to you all, my brothers and sisters in Christ. I love and respect every one of you, even if you disagree with me, even if you come for me in the comments. Know that all I'm doing is praying for you regardless. God bless you and keep you until next time, friends. In Jesus' name, I pray many blessings over your life. Amen.